<clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Sorry that we're running a couple of minutes late, uh, but we have quite a large audience tonight, which is very lovely to see. And welcome all to Milton Keynes Lich Fest. Uh, tonight we are joined, uh, this is one of the very first occasions where we've invited somebody back because we liked them so much the first time. We're delighted to have with us the poet and novelist Luke Kennard. Uh, if you were at Lit Fest in 2019, uh, you will have heard and indeed seen Luke uh, reading alongside Mary Jean Chan. Uh, tonight, we're, we are delighted to have him here solo, uh, reading from his most recent collection, Notes on the Sonnets. Um, let me read you the, the blurb from the back of the book so you've got some idea before I let Luke give his own introduction. Luke Kennard recast Shakespeare's 154 sonnets as a series of anarchic prose poems set in the same joyless house party. A physicist explains dark matter in the kitchen. A crying man is consoled by Sigmund Freud action figure. An out of hours doctor sells vials of dark red liquid from a briefcase. Someone takes out a guitar. We're in the home city of the Open University, so I think we've all been to that kind of party many times in the past. Uh, but let me hand over to Luke now, who will tell you far, far more about Notes on the Summit and give you the pleasure of hearing several extracts from it. Take it away, Luke. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you for thanks for having me back. Um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, can I just check? I'm, I'm kind of sharing my screen just so that I can kind of scroll through the PDF of the book and you can you can read along um, should you wish. I have a tendency to read quite fast and to mumble and everything. So it feels like, you know, and also just if anyone needs the text as well, it's there. But I'm also worried that I might have created some kind of horrific mise on a beam where my screen is sharing, my screen is sharing my screen. But does it look, does it look okay? Is it just, you can, you can adjust, yeah, fine. Okay, yeah, that's good. Well, that's fine. Go through the text, that's fine. I was at a live reading recently where somebody was zoomed in and, um, and, and they just, they didn't have their face on the screen at all. And um, ju were just scrolling through a Word document and, and had to be stopped after about 10 minutes. So we, 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 we have paid to see your face as well, if you would please actually stop doing that. Um, but yeah, as long as this is okay, that's, that's, that's grand, that's good for me. Um, there's a little tiny um, intro note, um, which the screen is on at the moment. All of this takes place at the same house party. The order of the sonnets is determined by events. They are to be seen as improvisations or annotations or variations. Um, I've got plenty of time, so I can maybe say a little bit about the process behind some of the pieces. Um, I won't go as far as reading the original sonnets, although at some point I might do that. At some point I'm just going to do an all-night recording where I read every single one of the sonnets and every single one of my responses to them. And that would take about seven hours. And people could just check in and out whenever they wanted to. It would be kind of Andy Kaufman reading the whole of The Great Gatsby kind of thing. Um, and I, I, whenever I've read from this book, I, I, I tend to change which poems I read. I find a kind of different route through the book. Sometimes that goes well. And sometimes it's, I don't know, sometimes it's kind of bleak. Sometimes I accidentally read all the really sad ones and leave everybody feeling fairly morose. I'll try not to do that. I'll try and vary it. I'll try and read, read some of the ones that are slightly lighter as well as the, uh, the tortuous, embittered love poems. I'll begin with the opening poem, which is based on Sonnet 66, which is a strange one to, to start on. But as this, as this note says, the, uh, the order in which I, I wrote these is determined by the events of the, of the semi-real, semi-unreal party. Um, and this was the first one that I wrote in real life when I didn't have any plan to actually write this as a, as a, as a whole book. Um, this was kind of just a one-off poem, which I wrote at a party of which I was feeling slightly alienated. Hence, I sat in the corner and wrote a poem as sensitive boys have been doing for many years. Um, and then I kind of, I just like the effect of this one. I like the effect of um, writing in response to something as kind of heavy and as reputable as, as Shakespeare's sequence of sonnets. And I thought I'd try doing a couple more, see how it worked. And then it just became a kind of obsession for about a year where every day I would try to write something, some kind of prose poem type piece in response to one of the sonnets, usually deciding what I wanted to happen next in the narrative and trying to find a sonnet that corresponded to that in some way. But this is the, this is the first one. The book is in nine parts. 
it's, it's quite long. So I'll just read some, some bits of it. Um, I might have to adjust my screen slightly. There we go. One, 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 one. Just in case it's off the page. And the way the editor, I might just zoom out a little bit. Um, the way the editor formatted this was to put um, the first line of the sonnet in question at the top, a little number of the sonnet, so you can track down the original, should you wish to. Um, and then the prose poem underneath. So I'll just, yeah, I will just launch into, into this one. That was a laboured introduction, apologies. Sonnet 66, tied with all these who restful death, I cry. Sometimes a party feels like a portal you have to pass through and sometimes not. I don't know with cocaine. It's like everyone cheating on the same cryptic crossword. My ideal recreational drug would be a pill that makes people feel more insecure and I'm the only one at the party not taking it. In the kitchen, I'm in the kitchen with a man who says he can recite any of Shakespeare's sonnets if someone gives him a number from one to 154. And I'm like, wow, that's great, 66? And he says, no, not 66, anything but that. I'm like, okay, ha ha ha, you're full of shit. He says, I'm not lying. I'm just not reciting sonnet 66, not tonight or any other night. I hate it. This has honestly never happened to me before. Give me any other number. And I find that hard to believe because if you're asked to pick a, a random number from one to 154, the chances are it might be 66, but I sip from the rum and coke someone gave me and I sigh and I say, okay, 102. And he starts, and I swear to God, this is a true story. He starts cold. My love is strengthened though more weak in seeming. I turn on the convection hob and put my palm on it. Sonnet 111. You give me the private signal to rescue you, and I have to interrupt you kissing an artist on the staircase. I can tell that she is an artist because she is so covered in paint, and so now are you. The way construction workers are always building things, the way demolition crews never really get to take a day off. The demolition never ends. They take it with them where they go. What's our excuse? A writer is always looking for creative ways to fall into a threshing machine. You're all woe who invited the oncologist. We're talking to an award-winning double act. Do you get tired, we ask them, of being a double act? Do people expect you still to be a double act when you're off duty? But they say it's okay because their act is based on the fact that they have no natural repartee. You have to do something which destroys you, some personal brand which subdues your nature. Everyone knows that what you draw out with one undefiant glance. Oh you, oh you, I know. We will give each other a disease to which we alone are the cure, the cure that reinfects, the reinfection that's the cure. Sonnet one. The party kind of gets slightly more complicated as the night goes on. The rooms, the kind of shape of the house seems to kind of change slightly. The number of rooms and the number of guests seems to change. A lot of the people at the party are kind of, I don't know, either academics of one discipline or another, or um, artists or writers of one kind or another. People have various sort of spiritual and intellectual disagreements as well as things in common. Um, and the narrator, I suppose one of the things that, um, that maybe struck me as a student when I was first reading Shakespeare's songs, but definitely kind of coming back to them years later, um, is that the speaker in the poems is kind of, is kind of, I don't know, it's, a, it's kind of an obsessive person. Often the, the feelings that are expressed while well, they're seen as kind of this amazing sequence of the most beautiful love poems ever written. Um, often it's not a particularly good kind of love. Like there's a whole sort of sequence within the 154 sonnets where the, uh, the speaker of the poem is, is embittered that two people he was previously having an affair with have, have now got together themselves and he's insanely jealous of both of them um, and tries to express those, those feelings of jealousy and rage. It's, it's, it's odd and quite sort of openly toxic at times in a way that's sort of interesting and weirdly liberating. And it gives you this kind of framework, I guess, for writing about love with a kind of brutal honesty, for writing about identity and idea of self with a kind of brutal honesty as well. Um, yeah, anyway, so this is, this is based on Sonnet 1. Um, still at the party. Some of them are less ostensibly at the party, but they still are. They're just taking place within guests of the party's heads. From various creatures we desire increase. 
We have been told that the perfect human is at the party. We look forward to meeting them and finding out what they're like. Unassailable, beyond reproach. Naturally, there are rumours of their misdeeds. The perfect human is not perfect. This assumption reflects badly on us. Yes, the perfect human has done some pretty bad shit, but they've also been through a lot. They came from humble origins, but now they write celebrated papers demythologizing the humble origins trope. They keep their money in a dirty pillowcase and distribute it generously. They don't really like the one art for which they are recognised or the field in which they incontestably dominate. They prefer NASA. Car. They say this in interviews a lot. There is not a single act of cruelty, selfishness, and abuse of power the perfect human has committed, which cannot be fully explained by systemic issues they themselves have gracefully endured and emerged triumphant. This is what we mean when we say the perfect human does not exist. We mean they are like Euler's identity equation, an equation so beautiful it has been compared to a Shakespearean sonnet. Five complex numbers are plotted on the complex plane and together form a house shape. When we meet them, we will say we are big fans big fans, the perfect human will say. My father worked in a factory that made big fans. But look at you now, perfect human, we will say. Look at you now. Hmm. Let's read next. This one, it's on at 16, but wherefore? not you a mighty away. I think I told you about my friend who, when we were 17, had a date tattooed on his ankle, and to my shame I can't remember the exact date, blank 0525, because our idea was that we should all meet up in exactly 25 years' time on Ham Hill, surrounded by living flowers, whatever else was going on in our lives, whatever we'd done, whatever had been done to us, whatever, just drive over there from wherever we'd washed up, drawn by our own sweet skill or otherwise, and meet up at precisely 6pm on that day. But the consensus was that we'd probably only remember it if we got the date tattooed on our ankles. We didn't think it possible to remember happy hour in the perfectly dingy bell and crown a whole 25 years later, although of course I do. And he was the sweetest and most impulsive and he went ahead and got the tattoo the next week. And we were like, oh God, you took that seriously. 25 years seemed like a comically long time to us. He was justifiably angry. We'd agreed. It was a pact. We were all no. It was hypothetical. And also tattoos sound really painful. That's endearing and also really awful, you say. You check my bare ankle to be sure it wasn't me. Scroll through. There are no bookmarks on PDFs, which is which is irritating, but hey. Um, it's a weird one. It's an even weirder one. I've been working with an Italian translator on this book recently, and um, and that's just involved like every day him sending me a six thousand word email of notes saying like, Luke, what does this mean? What on earth are you talking about? How on earth can we make this work in Italian? It's led to some kind of useful and slightly frustrating dialogues. Um, this one he particularly hated. Uh, so I won't read this one in honor of Carlo. I will not read Sonnet Forty Six. Um, hmm, no, not this one either. I'll find one I like momentarily, don't worry. Um, hmm. Sonnet 37. As a decrepit father takes delight. The way hangovers mature in your 30s into a kind of existential mold. I want the kind of success and happiness for you I want for my own children. I want you to feel loved and known or known and loved or failing that because really who can expect such extravagance? I want the ache to be transfigured into something you can use. Otherwise, knowing that you exist, that at this moment you are waiting for a train, that you have had to start the same page again because you weren't concentrating, that you were tired, that if someone asked you something, they would get to hear your voice. I love the channels damned with exhausting half thoughts. Funny how the latte has become one of the laziest class signifiers, as if every dead high street didn't contain at least two costas. Sonnet 38. Mathematician becomes kind of a slightly running character throughout this, as some of them do. How can my muse want subject to invent? The mathematician draws sequences of W's and M's in the condensation on the window. Every interval contains infinite transcendental numbers. Okay? Yes, I say. I'm genuinely interested. Do you want to draw the next one? M, W, M, W, W, M, W, W, W. No, she says, that's too many W's. 
She draws another sequence. This sequence cannot occur anywhere in the infinite list of sequences, even though it's infinite. Do you understand? No, I tell her, I'm an intuitionist. Each muse is responsible for two muses who are in turn responsible for two muses who are responsible for two muses. Zoom out far enough and it looks like a flower, further and it just looks like the world. Look, you did ask, she says, clearing the window with her sleeve. I was having a nice night. Take this party, I say. It remains forever in the status of creation, but is not a closed realm of things existing in themselves. Actual infinity was taken as a threat to the absolute infinity of God. At one point, George Cantor sent a letter directly to Pope Leo XIII to clarify. All infinities are at the disposal of the Almighty. Cantor's youngest son died in 1899, while Cantor was in the middle of giving a lecture on Baconian theory and Shakespeare. Shakespeare's only son died aged 11 in 1596. Is it mindless sentimentality to feel sad about this? What is that feeling? The universe, if real, must be finite. She grabs one of my earlobes and squeezes hard. In both space and time. You're hurting me. The essence of mathematics is its freedom. She lets go of my ear. No one shall expel us from the paradise it has created. Skip along a bit, because um, I'm gonna read. No, I'll do this one because it's kind of rhymy one. And then I'll do Sonnet 6, because that's my favorite. Since I left you, my eye is in my mind. That's one of my favorite, my favorite opening lines of the, of the whole Sonnet sequence 113. <laughs> The bridge, the mountain, the lake, the ibex, the chocolate cake, the collected poems of Robert Lowell, the jar of cinnamon sticks, the slapping rain, the tiny dog, the paint chipped from the windowsill, the momentary concerned glance which passes like a shaft of light, the coffee cup, the flooded rails, the empty cracked shell of a snail, the grey fuzz of a scratch card nail, the things we said inside the whale, prostrate before the turning sail, the something and the something else, betrayal of, betrayal from, look over over, through, or set upon. The double dream, the double glaze, a less bad way out of the maze. Sometimes the action cannot match a long recalibrating days. And sometimes, sometimes even when I'm the only one with you, I want to text you, are you okay? Is this guy bothering you? This is a part of... Hmm. Uh, yeah, start of, start of part two. Um, I'll just read a little excerpt from the original Sonnet 6, just as a kind of example of, I guess, kind of the, the method in some way. The method is sometimes quite loose. Um, sometimes it would just be a kind of, it would be a couplet that particularly stood out to me from a, from a sonnet, a particular image that I found puzzling or intriguing. Other times it would just be the general vibe of the sonnet or the or the the kind of message that it seemed to be trying to explore to deliver the idea of love that it was exploring. Um, there would be enough to kind of set me off on something. Um, with this one, um, sonnet six kind of contains lots of stuff around multiples of ten. It contains the um, the four lines. That's for thyself to breed another thee, or ten times happier be it ten for one. Ten times thyself were happier than thou art if ten of thine ten times refigured thee. It's kind of one of the procreation sonnets. It's one of the ones where he is sort of telling the, the young man he's in love with that he should be having lots of children because it's terrible of him to deny future generations of the opportunity to meet him. Um, so it's more about that, but I, I kind of, I, I took the kind of multiples of 10 thing in another direction. Um, this one, I think, sometimes I pretend that a poem is based on a dream when it wasn't, but I think this one actually was, this one was um, based on a dream of, um, of, of, of living with 10 identical people and being in love with all ten of them. Then, not, uh, sorry, then let not winter's ragged hand deface. I had a dream that there were 10 of you and we lived in a duplex overlooking the river. It was the only nice part of town. I wanted to make 10 of you happy, but it was difficult. And mostly I felt like I was letting at least eight of you down. Even though the 10 of you were exactly you and exactly the same, you cannot stroke 10 people's hair and tell them they are good, they are so good. And oh, the divergent seconds where lived experience changed you. Even the inanities. I love what you've done to your hair. Is that a new top? Could you just shift over a little? I didn't think I was up to the job. 
so this is a job for you. I don't want to make any special claims here. Nobody ever walked down to a river without at least considering taking a dive. We only owned nine mugs, for instance, and it only struck me years later, snow fishing in a void I'd learned to wrap around myself, how easy it would have been for me to do something about that. Just got a silly party bum, sort of eight music to hear while you hear us the music, sadly. One thing guaranteed to kill a party is when people take out their phones and start sharing amusing films with each other. This was never an issue in the 90s, but in the 90s it killed a party when someone brought out a guitar. So I don't expect you to forgive me when I find a guitar in the second bedroom and use my phone on which plays a film of me playing the same song yesterday as a plectrum. Unless everyone's going to sing, then it's fine. Otherwise, I don't know performance and humiliation. Years ago at a party, a man I was in love with used to read the bad short stories I gave him, even though I gave them to him at a party, which was hardly the time or place. Once he asked me to read a paragraph out loud and stopped me because he said I was insulting my own writing. And he was right, I was, and with good reason. We disagreed over the existence of God and he would get so angry if I apologized after an argument that he'd just walk away. I'll try and find some of the. Um, I felt that with with some, with the, some of the more kind of famous celebrated sonnets, the response had to be particularly insolent or unpoetic. Um, so I should do. Um, shall I compare you to a summer's day? Which is on page forty-eight, according to my. Copy. Mm. Here we go. Sorry, you have to subscribe for like 30 pounds a month to edit a PDF and just can't do that. Um, so I'm just going to flick through. Yeah, okay, Sonnet 18, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Chesterfield's Act of 1750 introduced the Gregorian calendar already used by the majority of Europe to Great Britain, losing us 11 days. In order for us to get into sync, 1751 was only 282 days long. Up to that point, the year began on March 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, Lady Day. This is why to this day, the tax year begins on April 6th, which on the old style calendar is March 25th. That's wild, right? So the darling buds of May are actually shaken by the rough winds in the 16th century on July 17th the day Lady died, 1959. I don't know if this is as important as it feels, but it feels important insofar as we might compare one another to a necessary adjustment which has unintended repercussions far beyond the administrative. Hmm. No, not this one. Maybe this one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it's okay. 116. One of the kind of real big league sonnets. Let me not just the marriage of two minds. Probably the worst company are the people who lament the lost art of conversation. Let's say you take upon yourself a platitude. You are drawn to unattainable people. The sort of phrase so overgrown with moss and lichen it can barely pass for insight anymore. We cannot love ourselves any more than a camera can love itself. We only want something distant enough to be idealized. Thank you. No, don't light it. I want to pontificate with it. We navigate by the North Star because its position happens to be more or less in line with the Earth's axis. In fact, it is exactly one degree off and traces a very small arc in the night sky. Nonetheless, it holds fast over bad waters for the tea merchant and the human trafficker. Let the war criminal say, I never claim to be perfect. Let's say, for fuck's sake, nobody ever asked for perfection. What's required of us is the absolute bare minimum, I know. You know the Elizabethan marriage ceremony was quite severe. I require and charge you as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed. I mean, mix that with your confetti rights. We edited it because we're so pathetic. But memory is the present's diet exclusively, since our hopes, ingredients, our memories anyway. That's neuroscience. No wait, come back. 
quite often the poems kind of dramatize just losing somebody's interest at a party. <laughs> you're just kind of realizing you've talked for too long and just gone off topic too much. But that genuinely is neuroscience, um, that fact, in, in so far as the parts of the brain that we use to project forwards, to hope for things or to imagine what something is going to be like, or to make distant plans into the distant future, what, where we hope to be one day, is exactly the same part of the brain that lights up when we're remembering something, whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant memory. Um, and I kind of love that, that, that we sort of construct it out of the same material. We, we, we rebuild our memories constantly and we sort of rebuild that we, we project forwards into the future using exactly the same synapses. And there's something in that that I cannot even get my head around. Um, I think I'll read this one because I am at work and I did have to write like four references today. It's that kind of, it's that kind of season in academia, uh, 21. So it is not with me as with that music. I wrote so many references today. I cannot stop describing everyone I meet as reliable and punctual and intelligent and a great communicator. I am sure they will continue to conduct themselves thus as they enter the professional sphere. As they are absorbed by a bright green gelatinous floating sphere, I have every confidence that they will retain atoms of their personality up to and including the ability to love and to be loved. We praise to sell, okay, but also because that's what the empty box requires of us. It's all plumbing. It's all making sure it flows. You could do a book without blurbs but it would look sort of undressed you could do a book without acknowledgments because thanking people presupposes anyone else is going to like it so it was when we were young we wouldn't stop talking until someone clamped their hand over our mouths and then we'd lick their hand all the little birthday candles in heaven crooner voice god wanted me to know i am the lowest of the low maybe we all carry a low-key torch for the hard drinking writing tutor without a good word to say about anyone because when he compliments you he really means it you know but really better to put his head on a stick oh, this is, okay, okay okay yeah this one has like a lot of hearts and eyes in it the original poem does so i just really went to town on that um my glass will not persuade me i am old well i'm kind of going increasingly great so my glass kind of is starting to persuade me that i'm in my 40s um this is yeah sonnet 22 the hearts roughly the size of footballs on chicken legs running blindly through a forest. The hearts hunted for sport. The hearts factory farmed for food. The hearts kept as idiosyncratic pets by rich idiots. The hearts sitting at miniature school desks in front of a whiteboard with a diagram of a brain on it. The hearts breastfeeding in a dimly lit room just to keep them quiet, not because they're hungry. The hearts asking for the same song over and over again. The hearts finally exclaiming, what more do you fucking want from me? The hearts drinking wine from hourglasses. The hearts standing outside their wood frame houses while a heart with a clipboard unloads a truckload of hearts and says here are the hearts you ordered the hearts trying to explain their process because you did ask even though they can tell they're boring you the hearts letting their hair down for once the hearts at a sleepover playing never have they ever the hearts i'm done i'm done i'm done i'm sorry sonnet 23 as an unperfect actor on the stage I'm trying to articulate exactly what makes me a bad actor aside from lack of training and experience. I can read a story to my kids with absolute conviction and do the voices. I can read a poem out loud because I know what to play down. When you read a poem, all that's required is that you be yourself but worse. But if I have lines and a character and other people depending on my performance, it's just awful and everyone feels embarrassed for me. An English busker may put on an American accent if the song is American. This is something we can only forgive ourselves. A good actor reading a good poem sounds terrible because they hit every note too well. Good actors can only read bad poems. Aside from all that, I am fascinated by line reading and the way a great cast could make bad dialogue lastingly poignant and affecting. If someone says I love you, there is a moment there where you get to choose exactly how to deliver your response. I don't think I'm gonna read this one, but it's, it's about Caravaggio's Judas beheading Holophanes. It's a good painting. And, the, and the, yeah, it's a good painting and the Judith thing, the Caravaggio version really reminds me of an ex. Exactly the same face, just incredible transplanted across history. She did not cut my throat, but um, was always worried that it might come to that. Um, not this one, no, 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 no. Mm. I never read this one, but I think I will. 27. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed. 
We went on a pilgrimage and when we reached the destination, we saw many miracles. An uncreated light descended upon us. A loaf of bread got no smaller, however much we ate of it. Hundreds touched a worn out indentation of a foot in a rock and went off healed. Or we went on a pilgrimage and when we reached the destination, we saw wooden boxes containing fragments of bone. An attendant shooed us away. The smell of lavender could not camouflage the open sewers. Outside, we stopped to stroke a stray cat, but it scratched us and the scratches puffed up like zippers. We developed a fear of water, which is a sure sign of rabies. The meal was mostly fat, our knives could not cut through. That was when sharing a single bed, narrower than a single bed, the pilgrimage continued, or when it started, I don't know. We closed our eyes. If you orbit a black hole and watch someone else floating into it, they will appear to you to stop completely still at the threshold forever. In just this way, we move ever slower towards ourselves. Let's do, that was too grumpy. This is kind of narrative, but no, nah, nah, it's too, yeah, self-indulgent. Hmm. Okay, Sonnet 91 um, kind of compares people who like hawks with people who like horses, um, which I kind of, maybe I guess made into a slightly more literal analogy for personality. Um, and then the horse kind of the, the horse kind of keeps recurring in the sonnets throughout this. There's a sad horse and a happy horse character who keep coming back. Maybe I'll finish on a couple of those after this one. Some glory in their birth, some in their skill. Some cannot help the way they're feeling, some can. Some are hawks, some are horses. Horses believe we are all essentially the same. Hawks know better. Horses fear the broken cobblestones. Hawks try to avoid large bodies of water. Horses have the largest eyes of any land mammal. They see all apples as green and their retina is called the nervous tunic. That's true. I looked it up in a book about horses. I love that name for a retina. Um, and their retina is called the nervous tunic. Hawks can perceive the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and magnetic fields. They can use their indented fovea to zoom in on distant objects. Horses, Tuesday. Hawks, Thursday. Their retinue is called a kettle. Horses think they're getting away with it. Hawks are aware of every unspoken thing that passes between us. Horses, nose bags. Hawks, hoods. Horses, blinkers. Hawks fuck in the air as they free fall down to earth. The strangest thing a human being ever said to a horse is the most sensible thing a human being ever said to a hawk. If you pass by a strange horse and do not say, oh, a horse, the horse will take umbrage. Hawks have never seen anything more ridiculously beautiful than a bridge. We're reading on part three. I should maybe just zoom much later into the zoom much later into the book to try and read some that I don't read so often. I don't know. So I'll do that. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Mm. Yeah, I never read this one. I'll, I'll just go on for another kind of five minutes. But it's kind of nice to read some that I never really read out loud. What potions have I drunk of Siren Tears, Psalm 119? What was I thinking standing on the balcony? It was where I started writing. To dream a balcony means you need support or peace. I was standing on the balcony. It was there I realized I was right next to my hotel, the one I thought I'd have to take a taxi to. Its logo reflected in my highball glass. I was thinking the law of all motion is to always involve one another in interesting situations. When I struck my forehead on the corner of a glass door, just hard enough to draw blood, a single line that ran around my eye. Now the homeopath will treat me, but only if I fall in love with her. I'm not a homeopath. I study the history of homeopathy. I'm sorry. Reciprocal affection must exist between the doctor and the patient. Syrups and juleps have very little inherent virtue, as Eliphas Levi says. Now, this is also how we see each other. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you will believe in the memory of the substance in the water. I check my drink and the hotel logo is still there. She gives me two tiny white pills. Let's talk about how you can't enjoy anything. What did the angel in hell say to the demon in heaven? What did the angel in hell say to the demon in heaven? 
whispered into a contact microphone. Changing the subject so often indicates an unquiet mind. Fourth opinion. I don't know. What did the demon in heaven say to the angel in hell? No single object can fully and permanently contain the images to which it is related. You are watering the plants, your ears stopped with wax. Cara, Mia, Tiamo, solo tu, solo tu, solo tu. Okay, this is like a companion piece too. I had a dream that there were 10 of you, so I'll do this one as well. Oh, how thy worth with manners, may I see. Sonnet 39. Far worse, of course, if there were 10 of me. Five would be moody, tearing the labels off our beer bottles. Four would be bursting with ideas. Should we look for a new flat? Can you help me hand bind these pamphlets? And naturally, I'd see myself as the most important me, despite the other nine all claiming to be the original, to the point where you wouldn't know anymore. We'd all drawn X's on our foreheads. If I ever got any time with you alone, I'd weep and say, you have to believe me. We have to find some way of getting rid of them. You'd have heard that from each of us in turn. One of me keeps eating my Raymond noodles and I'm not sure if it's one of the sad ones or one of the happy ones. There is only so much up-tempo college rock you can listen to in one sitting. We'd all get colds at the same time. We'd say, I feel like a father, as if it was the worst thing. Once you'd left us, we'd really turn on one another. Is it remotely surprising? We'd eat cold pizza with cigarettes stubbed out in the middle. We'd barely look each other in the eye. Sonnet 40. In the living room, we play a game where we work out how many years, strictly speaking, we ought to be in jail for, googling maximum sentences for the petty crimes for which we were never caught or to which we never confessed, assuming the imaginary judge is having a bad day. I never shoplifted in the pure sense, but once, no, twice, the second time it didn't work, I swapped the label on a CD I wanted so I could pay a lower price. Fair skipping, trespassing, a little light perjury. Some are in deeper. Kevin, for instance, should never see the light of day again. After going through multiple counts of possession for class A, B and C drugs, we're all pretty much dead of old age in our cells, even though none of us will identify as drug users per se. Generally, we see anything we do wrong as quite out of character, exceptions which prove our overall decency and for which no punishment is necessary, which is privilege in action, which is why we feel grateful and ashamed a lot of the time and also why we are ridiculous. There's one about um, apologizing and artificial intelligence, which I'd kind of like to end on if I can find it. But on the way, I might find one that I'd prefer to read. So that's okay, but we'll end on that. <laughs> I plan to, plan to end on that. Mm. No, I'll end on this one instead. Let's so find it in here. Oh, here it is. Yeah, sorry, it's on page 165. It kind of, I don't know, it just works as an ending. I'm gonna move this little window. Let's go down. One, three, one, oh man. Wrote a book that is far too long. No, there, one, five, five, we're nearly there. Thanks so much for listening to me for so long. It's extremely kind of you. Um, yeah, this one, okay. I'm sort of obsessed with artificial intelligence and um, like, I don't know, sort of methods of optimization. Sometimes I feel as though just the way in which we self-edit is not unlike, not unlike an algorithm, the way in which we are honest or dishonest, varying degrees to ourselves or to each other. Um, and this poem kind of explains that. That you were once unkind befriends me now, which is the first line of Sonnet 120. The first computer-generated apology was so graceful and convincing, people assumed it was fake, that there was someone inside the casing operating tiny levers, but there wasn't. This created all sorts of possibilities. 
Soon it was accepted that most relationships could benefit from some degree of artificial optimization via basic logic gates. We really listen to each other. When you do that, this is how it makes me feel. I'm not saying it's reasonable, but it's the reason I react the way I do. I'm sorry I made you feel like that. I didn't know. God, I love the long shadows in the evening. I'll try to be more aware of my tendency to, no, no, it's okay. I know I'm oversensitive when you're so kind to me. I know you didn't want or mean to make me feel like that. Yeah, but sometimes I try to preempt any negative reaction you might have instead of letting you express it. And I can see that that's actually a form of passive aggression on my part. Just fucking kiss me. But the thing was, it could get sort of convoluted sometimes. I just desperately want to talk to the real you. I need you to turn the AI off for a moment. Tell them I'm already off, the AI would say. Tell them I've always been off. I'll leave it there. I'm gonna stop showing my screen. This will suddenly be a massive screen of people. <laughs> Thank you. If you'd like to unmute yourselves and, and give Luke a proper round of round yeah. applause. <laughs> Okay. That was awesome. Thank you, Luke. That was really brilliant. Yeah. That's really kind of you. You never know. You never know on Zoom, do you? You just you just never know. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was totally right. Whether you're just really upsetting everyone. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same with teaching on Zoom. Never entirely, never entirely sure. But thank you. It's really kind. Um, and and thanks for listening. Um. No I, I felt transported completely somewhere else and it was wonderful so thank you we we have quite a number of questions for you Luke, from the audience but i'm going to start with one which i think is actually more of a request mm -hmm. uh and i we might need to uh to go backwards and forwards between you and the person asking it to make sure you you know what they mean can you read the grumpy poem please the which one the grumpy poem it was a request oh. by kd there was one that I said was too grumpy. <laughs> Actually, I think that's... most of them are. <laughs> if there's time at the end, I will find the grumpiest one. Let me scroll back up. We've got a whole host of questions here for you. Um, okay, Charlie has asked you, what inspired you to combine the conventions of both prose and poetry instead of just sticking to one of the two? Hmm. I mean, they're all, they're all, um, I mean, as you can see, I don't need to show you, you could see on the screen, they're, they're all prose poems to a greater or lesser extent um, in the, in the collection, but you kind of, I guess the prose poem is kind of porous and expansive enough so that you can, you can play around with internal rhyme, you can play around with iambic pentameter even within it and just sort of drop in these occasional lines that actually maybe have a similar cadence to some of the lines in the sonnets but it's 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 quite freeing as well and it's quite open and it it felt like i guess just because the i mean shakespeare bends the the rules of the sonnet whenever it works for the poem whenever it suits suits the writing but um i guess it just felt like a a good opposite to something that is as formal and, and, and controlled as a sonnet to respond with something that is the loosest possible poetic form. And I felt like it just gave, it gave me enough space. It gave me enough space to kind of really explore all the different ideas I had around the various, often the kind of weird um, outmoded elements of science or medicine that, 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 that feed some of the metaphors in the original sonnets and, and that often are kind of, and I suppose our ways of something that really hasn't changed is our superstitiousness, is our sort of magical thinking. I mean, our sort of our theology has kind of changed, does it sort of evolve, but there are things that still persist. Um, mathematics in a similar way has kind of evolved, but there are still like basic principles that are still really there, that are still... Um, so all of these kind of different systems of knowledge or systems of understanding or systems of completely failing to actually really understand ourselves, despite technological advancements and things like that. There was just lots of stuff that I wanted to kind of cram in there. Um, and I didn't want to respond to the sonnets with more sonnets, I guess, was my feeling, much as I admire the form. So I just wanted to do something that was like, hey, let's kind of, sort of blast this out a little bit. Also, the original sequence is really, is quite, um, God, I don't know, quite, what do I want to say, solipsistic in the way that lyric poetry can be. There's a lot of just sort of, woe is me, like why, 
all of, like <laughs> it's kind of really um uh, just angry and kind of blaming somebody for breaking up with him when he cheated on them sort of thing and it's kind of like, it's weird they are not as sort of loving as people tend to talk of them about um why am you, I bringing that up you kind of want to, to go back for 158 years telling him he's the most famous writer in history and gets a bloody grip sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think some of them were written sort of during um during sort of kind of a bit of an outbreak of plague right so it felt kind of yeah. nice responding to them during these were mostly written during the the, the main lockdowns i guess yeah. um when yeah. parties were a distant memory it felt like they were never coming back it felt like nobody was ever going to get to go to a party again so that gave me a kind of nostalgia <laughs> for them that kind of <laughs> fed into the setting i think as well as well as kind of being able to like draw on i guess draw on every party i've ever been to that kind of that felt like um that kind of feeds into the the narrative a little bit everyone you've ever met everyone you've ever had a crush on everyone you know everyone you've ever had an argument with it kind of all just sort of so it's like a kind of oh i don't know it's like this sort of slightly purgatorial space the party within this book <laughs> the, 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 the sonnets just gave me this framework to explore i don't i think i've talked for 10 minutes and not answered the question but see if i say anything good eh? <laughs> we'll, we'll love another one in your direction why not uh, this is from ang harris uh, did spending so much time with Shakespeare's sonnets and creating your own pieces around them change how you related to Shakespeare's work? Did you discover new things that you hadn't noticed before in it, for example? Mm, that's, a, that's a really lovely question. Yeah, it did. It did. It made, it made me really appreciate the, the sonnet sequence a lot more, appreciate the idiosyncrasy of it, appreciate the kind of the rawness and the desperation of it at times, so much as the performance. Um, it has, yeah, and it has kind of sent me back to the the plays, not to do any writing around them particularly, but just to just to reread and appreciate. And some of the ones that I've, all the ones I haven't read, you know, the ones that I pretend to have read in my on Shakespeare, Troilus and Cressida. Troilus and Cressida were great, actually. If you haven't read Troilus and Cressida, that's a really that is really good. I've, out of the out of the slightly less celebrated Shakespeare plays, Troilus and Cressida is gorgeous. Um, but it, yeah, it did. I think it did. Um, and maybe just, I think, just sort of appreciating them more than I did as a student as well. And kind of coming to them with a sort of not, I don't know, not not like iconoclastically, but definitely impertinently. And coming to this and just being, this is just, this is just some guy writing about cheating on his wife when it comes down to it. I mean, it is. Like, let's be honest. So, like, so kind of, like, <laughs> sorry, but like, but like, you know, so a certain sort of level of like, this is great art, this is great literature, but it, it's kind of, I don't know, I think that there are sort of ways of approaching it with slightly less, slightly less idolizing an attitude. And so, so I'm not that, I'm not that interested in poems that are just tributes. It is like, like, like just, you know, join a, join a pub rock band and play tributes. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't, these writers are already famous. They don't need, they can take it as well. They can take the hit of <laughs> writing against them too. It's kind of, these are kind of, you know, these are canonical writers. They're on tea towels and things like that. They, they are never going to be any less famous than they are. Um, and it's kind of okay. It's okay to sort of treat that material, I think, fairly experimentally and just come to it with, with a different approach. Even, you know, in the, in the same way that, that people write sort of really strange and inventive adaptations of the of the plays as well and kind of either in the way that the, the directorial choices or just complete sort of new plays based on a vague the vague plot um yeah i'm drifting sorry answered one of my questions as well which was was there any point when i mean these are canonical works was there any point in the the whole writing process where you thought I, I shouldn't be touching Shakespeare's sonnets with a barge pole. This is this is mm. legendary stuff, and I'm mm. like some bloke in Birmingham. Yeah, no, I think that, no, that just never. I think just thanks to my arrogance. But no, I think maybe <laughs> maybe I think maybe because I'd written a project on um, Kane a few years before, and the middle of that was um, thirty-one perfect anagrams of Genesis four verses one to twelve, the mm. bit where. Um, the ground is cursed and Cain is cursed by God after he slays Abel. Um, and that was just taking that, that, that short passage, taking exactly those letters, reconfiguring them in 31 different ways to tell different stories, to do different things, um, which is sort of much more, you know, the sort of sacred text. 
yeah. the kind of yeah. first chapter of the Bible. But that, but that, and that kind of felt okay as well. It sort of, I felt like there's a way of doing this that is at once kind of subversive and still kind of respectful. There's a way of doing this that is um, strange and inventive and isn't just sort of saying how wonderful this is. I mean, you, you know, you, just, you don't need to hear someone saying, isn't this glorious? Isn't this amazing? You can kind of, you can, I think you can sort of afford to, I think you can afford to be slightly more. Yeah, and art, anyway. art doesn't exist to, to worship other bits of art. Right, right. Yeah, and I find it kind of disappointing when it does. I find like poems that are just, um, poems that just name drop much more famous poets. <laughs> just be like, oh, oh, what a great poet. Because I only just write your own poem. <laughs> Why don't you try and be a great poet? Instead of just saying, oh, isn't Borges wonderful? It's like, I can... And get that I'm at home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm. I'm going to. I'm. Sh I'm sure she will forgive me, and and she'll email me if she doesn't. I'm going to paraphrase a question from Kirsty because it was kind of long. Um, <laughs> uh, Kirsty's really interested when visual art and literature refer to older works of art and and kind of bring the past back to bear on the present moment. What was it about the sonnets that kept you engaged with them? And what is the most important thing you're trying to bring back from them to now? Good. I think to a certain extent it was kind of, I don't know, it was sort of, after a while it was kind of bloody mindedness. Like after I'd done about 50 of them, and I've got 104 to go, and I'm kind of running out of steam, actually, to be honest with all this. And, and then you just, there, there's a bit in um, in um, Eugene O'Negan's, uh, sorry, in Pushkin's Eugene O'Negan, where um, there's there's a whole sort of Pushkin sonnet in that, where he's just saying, like, I cannot believe I set out to write so many of these. I'm so tired of this rhyme scheme. I'm so tired of writing in this form that I invented. And I don't want to do it anymore, but I have to because the story is not finished yet. So I've got to. And it's kind of I quite like works of art that contain either sort of doubt or just <clears> try to <throat> undermine themselves to a certain extent. Um, I think it was just like after a while, it's like I have set out to do this and I have to, I have to like keep going with it. I have to keep finishing it. Um, but it was kind of, it was the original sonnets themselves, I think. And it was just that kind of, it was that constant surprise in a way of going from poem to poem some of which I knew so much less than others I knew I knew, I knew the really prominent famous ones but a lot of them I hadn't reread since just skimming through it as a slightly Deshabeel undergraduate so I hadn't really concentrated on many of them at all and just finding these I don't know just these sort of wonderful and unexpected images these these bizarre ways of phrasing things or these bizarre ways of kind of capturing a feeling and stuff that's still has as much resonance now. And I think it was that that sort of kept me going, kept me engaged with it. And after a while, I suppose I felt like, okay, I'm kind of onto something here. Like this is sort of a way of talking about, this is like, this is still a way of talking about love. This is still a way of, um, we're no closer to defining it, but this is still like a really useful lens to try and write about that. Love and everything that goes wrong yeah. with love. Still head butting walls with bad parties. 458 years later. <laughs> I was going to say that's really nice, Luke, because it's so dense and the writing is so dense. But what I got from it is that what you were trying to be, bring back was this ode to kind of love. And um, really it's interesting that you said that because, yeah, there's so much going on. But, yeah, that's kind of what I thought was the value in it for you. And, and I feel you hey. brought that through amazingly. And, yeah, it was nice to hear you say that uh kind of, i think you kind of, it sort of leavens things a bit i think because they can they can get a bit i don't know it can get a bit one note if it's too kind of ironic or too kind of self-referential or something like that and you have to kind of yeah it's beautiful it be it's enough. hard you don't want to say this is about love because then it's cringy and you know yeah, yeah. you've done it in a beautiful way it's complicated it's around and bit, nuanced like and you know and yeah it's amazing i, I think it's incredible that's extremely kind of you thank you <laughs> a, a question from Rob Gifford. Uh, could you give us a little more explanation of the link between one sonnet and the specifics of the writing that reacts or responds to it? Yeah, so like, I, kind of, I think I just sort of really glanced over that um, in the reading. But it would be, there was a time when we were kind of editing it as a manuscript, where I was like, do you want, 
Should we just, just write some endnotes? Just write some really long endnotes that explain like each link here. And and my editor was just like, no, no, don't. Just like if anyone kind of wants to, they can read it alongside the original sonnets. They can sort of try and find potential links. Sometimes they're quite oblique, right? Sometimes sometimes it's sometimes it's very clear, right? So with Sonnet Six, it's kind of like just using that multiplication of 10 and just taking it in a slightly different direction expressing a slightly different nuance with it um other times it's like i think when i sort of started using the these consistent characters of the sad horse and the happy horse i was like well anytime a horse comes up in a sonnet i'm going to bring back the i'm going to bring back the dancing horses again and they're going to come they start sort of haunting the party after a while these two slightly surrealist sort of characters that represent two parts of the narrator's personality stay with me um so but this i just took permission every time a horse came up in the sonnets at all which it does about 23 times um to bring those characters back but then to have the horses kind of give voice to some of the complicated feelings being talked about in the in the sonnets so it was fairly i guess fairly kind of intuitive um and it and it would change what it was that i felt like responding to in in the sonnet, sometimes I feel, sometimes I'd be in a slightly bad mood with the sonnet. Like there are a lot that just there are a lot that just go on and on about um, about wrinkles, and it's like are you kind of you kind of shilling for the <laughs> Botox industry or something. It's like, this is like I don't really get this. I quite like wrinkles. <laughs> I like, I'm sort of quite quite comfortable with the fact that we you know we age that we are young for the same amount of time. It's it's it's, it's I, I kind of that that kind of thing felt both like it had dated really badly. In the sonnet, in kind of just sort of criticizing somebody's appearance or having the temerity to to exist in linear time, but also kind of it actually feels kind of relevant as well because the sort of the oppressive sort of beauty industry is sort of more invasive than ever, really. The kind of things that people are expected to subject themselves to now. So it felt weirdly dated and also like ugh, horribly personal still as well so i thought that almost needed to be taken to task because like, you stop by like the 14th sonnet where he's complaining about somebody starting to get wrinkled I was like shut up about that now man come on you see them more lately yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I, i'm listening to this and and wondering if you're familiar there was a, a wonderful um, exchange between mick jagger and keith richards in a radio interview with a pair of them and and jagger who is fairly vain human being um, <clears throat> was saying was was defending himself saying these aren't wrinkles these are laughter lines at, at which point Keith Richards leant into his microphone and said Nick nothing's that funny <laughs> Just a wonderful <laughs> step there. The, somebody should have whispered it to Shakespeare perhaps mm -hmm. a question from Caroline who in the nicest possible way is not going to spare your blushes uh, what was it like winning the forward prize and did anything change as a result? It was really, it was kind of shocking and really lovely because I sort of felt as though I was there with um, some friends and, and, and they were kind of like, this is kind of, this book is kind of too badly behaved. Like it's kind of, it's kind of, it's extraordinary that it's on the shortlist, but this is a really badly behaved book and, and, and <laughs> They don't give awards to badly behaved books. So I was kind of, and I was there just being like, it gets fun, it's fun to be there. And then I just got, and then I just got blind drunk and, and just kind of <laughs> got on stage and, and, and stumbled through a couple of the poems. And then I walked off the stage with um, two excellent poets who equally were deserving winning, Stephen Sexton and um, Claire Chingoni. And we went into a sort of little huddle, just being like, hey, pet each other and Charlie, whoever wins. And then the announcer just forgot to, uh, forgot to announce the winner. So we were just kind of left standing there. He accidentally turned two pages in his script instead of one and just went into his um, goodbye spiel. It was like, well, what a lovely <laughs> night we've had. Um, uh, we've heard some great poems. I hope everyone feels as though um, it doesn't really matter who won, that there was just some great work. It was wonderful. Little did I know 30 years ago when I established the forward prizes that we would one day be in the South Bank Centre. This was going on for some time. We were just standing there with our arms up backstage. Is, he say, Is there no winner? Did nobody? <laughs> this kind of... And the stage, the stage managers were just like losing their shit and just running back and forth, but, but not actually going on stage and telling him and saying, dude, oh, there's like... fucking one. And then he ended up, and then he ended up saying, Look, and I hope, yeah. And it was like, um, and before we go to the bar and just maybe I get one last drink before we uh before we all head home um, let's just have one last round of applause for our winners and at that point he said my name and I was kind of and I was slightly um, bemused and shocked and it did give me a few moments to collect myself so I didn't go on and behave like 
Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, <laughs> it was yeah, it was it was really surprising, and it was obviously really lovely. That's things really nice. I guess I guess like ultimately um, being sort of utopian. I guess what, what I rather than the sort of cultural hunger games that persists in this country, I'd rather that just everybody who writes, who makes art, who does anything has more time and more money rather than just the occasional person getting thrown a bit of a bone. I think in some ways it's kind of made me a worse person as well. It's made me more vain. It's made me more defensive. It's made me feel angrier that less hasn't changed. <laughs> like, I feel like more could have changed. I feel like I could have got more <laughs> opportunities. Than I so I think you know, in some ways it's ruined me as a human being. It's made me insufferable. Um, but I don't know, I don't know. It's kind of okay. And I think because I've sort of been, been knocking around for long enough by this point, I started, started doing this in like 2005 and I'm at least slightly thicker skinned than I used to be. And also just don't, um, I don't mind. Um, Cause I like it. <laughs> Kind of, I like what I've written, so I'm, I'm not as defensive about whether other people sort of like it or not. It's kind of, a, and I think that's just that is kind of, in a way that's kind of artistic integrity. Like you create something that you would be pleased by if you came across it by someone else in a journal or a, or, or a bookshop, whatever. That's kind of, as, and kind of as long as you're doing that, you can just kind of let go of everything else. You can let go of um, reputation and 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 the sort of things that fall from the sky and kind of go your way sometimes. So it's kind of, it's like, yeah, so it's a mixed thing. But I think in a lot of ways, it's just made me, it's made me a less good person. <laughs> <laughs> so, self-loathing is the righteous thing, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can find a weird way of not enjoying even the, <laughs> even the high points of my career. <laughs> I can ruin it for myself and will. <laughs> uh, question from Claire Morris. Uh, how did you anticipate people would read your sonnets, chronologically or thematically? Or just randomly, I guess. My mind, sorry, my mind was distracted by, um, by another question. Sorry, can we just go through that one again? <laughs> sure. Uh, how did you anticipate would read, people would read notes of the oh, sonnets, yeah. mm. chronologically or thematically? Um, can I explain about that? It's just yeah, that sure. I've I've read the uh, the sequence several several times chronologically, but then I I then approached it again by concentrating on the big fifteen, you know, um, mm. uh, the uh, time, love, um, self image, that kind of idea, and and I started reading those individually, and it created a completely different meaning. Which is quite interesting, and it's the the idea that depending on your starting point, you are creating different pictures or different photographs of people taking photographs of people taking photographs, which is the kind of image you started with at the beginning. Yeah. And as soon as I did that, I thought, "Blimey, this is amazing!" And my head exploded momentarily. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> when when I realised you were doing it, I thought. I've just got to get here and ask him and say, just stop messing with my head, please. <laughs> <laughs> there was anyway, a... so that was it. That was why. No, that's really good. That's really good. No, and I, th I think I kind of, I wanted people to be able to approach it however yeah. they wanted to, and whatever order in a way, like sort of like Anne Carson's book Float, that you can kind of just reshuffle and read in different, um, and something like B.S. Johnson stuff as well, and it's the Untouchables where you can just re rearrange the pages. And that really appeals to me. And I think there were, yeah, there is a sort of, there are like smaller through lines with the yeah. thematic poems, the dark lady poems and the sort of the pale youth poems and yeah. things like that, that they, they do kind of have their own story going on, which you can kind of trace in different directions. And I did have like a sort of, I had like a sort of flow chart at one point of like post it so we were all just trying to sort of map those out it doesn't really come together until like the last maybe the last 30 or so when when it becomes more of a narrative and the narrator kind of finds out that he's a landlord which he didn't realize and has a whole <laughs> block of tower block of people complaining to him about the conditions and he's never been aware that this has been so it's got so it takes on this it takes on this weird plot towards the end that still is kind of straining towards trying to be some kind of love story he's still with the person who he picked up at the party um but there are different routes to get to that yeah definitely yeah. and i think sort of one of the ways is drawing out like the big drawing out the big sonnets or kind of or just sort of 
drawing them out thematically but that's yeah some of that I kind of I feel like I could sort of reverse engineer a little bit as well and say that was totally that was all planned <laughs> that, was all, that was all that was all part of my yeah, thank you thank you, thank you. A uh, question from Catherine Sorensen. Uh, you mentioned Caravaggio's great Judith and Holofernes painting. Mm. Are you inspired by or influenced by visual art as much as by poetry? Listening to mm. you, I was put in mind in a good way of Dadaism and surrealism. Mm. That's yeah, that's just huge. That kind of influence, I think. That's really yeah, it's really kind of you to bring that up. It's yeah, um, and I think. In some ways, I'm sort of interested, maybe sort of interested in the way that surrealism has kind of evolved out of the historical movements. Although, like, I still, still I, I still go back to like Leonora Carrington's short stories. I think they are just magnificent. I think they've kind of, they've sort of stood the test of time better than like Breton and a lot of the other kind of opinionated old douchebags. <laughs> it's kind of like Carrington's short stories are still like incredibly refreshing and, and vibrantly strange. Um, uh, but yeah, I take a lot from that. I think it's an artistic movement, and like Dadaism for sure, and even just something like sort of Matisse and things like that. Just you can, it's quite sort of bold colors and shapes that kind of like, you're trying to sort of use that kind of aesthetic in 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 writing in some way, which can fall flat on its face or can work sometimes as well. Um, so there is that. Like, and I don't, I don't, I know. I, I suppose sometimes I use that kind of sort of notional ekphrasis thing where you sort of describe a painting that doesn't actually exist. I find that quite a useful technique sometimes that can lead to some good stuff. Um, but I, I do, yeah, I find just wandering around an exhibition like massively feeds, even if I'm not writing directly in response to particular paintings, it still, it still kind of goes in. It still kind of feeds that and just actually reading around about, about, about artists. So it's like, so occasionally I'll kind of, do something more direct, like with the the Judith and Holofernes painting. But quite often, it's sort of. I think the last thing before the the pandemic was probably the Blake, the William Blake show at Tate Britain, which was kind of gorgeous and had some. When was when was the Paul Arrego? I can't remember when the Paul Arrego was, but that was good too. Maybe that was in a little brief hiatus of the lockdown, where I felt like it was safe to go to a gallery for a bit. But that was good and very narrative. There there, there is wonderful. Um, Amanda Dalton poems about Paul Arrego's sequence, the policeman's daughter. There, yeah. So it's like, I like, I really, I admire, I really admire Rec Traces as a technique. I really like it. I really like um, work that kind of uses both that bounces off that. But I think there's a lot, that there's sort of, it's sort of no coincidence in a way that even like this, the, I was at a, a New York school conference recently. It was like John Ashbury and Barbara Guest and all of these writers who were kind of, you know, they were, they were all really good friends with painters and they were all, um, the work kind of fed, the visual work fed the poetry and the poetry fed the visual work, but not in these kind of direct ways. It wasn't necessarily in an, illust in an illustrative way. It was more like this painting somehow has given me permission to write in this way. And I can't quite articulate that, but, it, but it, it's part of, yeah, all of it. Thanks very much, Luke. I, I'm having a bad hair day, so I'm not putting my image. Hey, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as someone who's worked in visual arts and studied art history and also studied a little bit about um, cross-curricular arts, it's very good to hear. I mean, in a sense, it's twas ever thus and it's like mm. you firing off in different di creative directions and feeding off other disciplines in that way. And I've really enjoyed this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I, I think we have two more questions for you, if you, if you have the time. Yes. Uh, firstly, from Angharad, has the experience of responding and reacting to the sonnets inspired you to do more of this in the future? And if you did do another project like this, what pieces of writing would be tempt would you be tempted to use as a starting point? That's really good. My mum keeps trying to get me to do uh, John Donne. I love John Donne. Maybe love John Donne too much. <laughs> so I don't want to write anything in response to John Donne. Um, I'm working on, the thing I'm working on at the moment is about um, uh, jo the book of Jonah as a kind of follow up to Cain. But I think writing this book, which kind of interrupted the research I was doing on Jonah, um, has slightly changed my approach to that. To that, So it just feels like sort of, yeah, sort of treating the text in, finding different angles on the text and being slightly freer and looser with the influences that I'm able to bring in. Um, I suppose one thing I didn't want to do with Jonah is go back and do the kind of anagram thing that I've done with 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 Kane, which uh, and the anagrams are kind of very much they draw on some of the compositional techniques of 
the book of Genesis and Exodus, there are certain passages that were anagrams in the original Hebrew, obviously without vowels. Um, so I didn't want to kind of just go back and try and do the same trick again. And I've been struggling to find, I've, been, I've written like several poems that I'm okay with on, on, on Jonah, but I still haven't found kind of the hook yet on that, whether it's something like um, Kierkegaard's variations on the Abraham and Isaac story or something like that. I've been, I guess I've been writing like that. I've been writing kind of variations on the Jonah story, which is such a bizarre book of the Bible. Apparently one of the, according to various scholars, one of the latest additions to the, to the Old Testament and kind of acts as almost like a parody of the other prophetic chapters, Jonah being this really reluctant super reluctant probably it's 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 kind of a beautiful amalgamation of but from various different sources and that's just been exciting to read around and research into so I guess in a way I'm still doing this kind of project-based writing alongside that I'm working on a novel um, about a psychology experiment on attraction that again involves like a certain amount of like interdisciplinary research that, that sounds fancier than it is but just it, what, what I mean is um being like a magpie rather than an actual scholar and just reading until I find something that's like, I can use that, I can take that, I can take that. That's, I, I think that approach is something that, that suits me quite well, I think. So yeah, so I, but I don't know if I'll go back and, 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 and ever do something exactly like this again, that is like a sort of, a, sort of intertextual work in quite that way. I, maybe I'll do like one more Old Testament thing after Jonah, I'm not sure which one, but then that's it. Like three of those, three of those is enough. Then I'll find something else to do. <laughs> Somebody's somebody snuck in one more question. Do we have time for two, Luke? Mm, Is that okay mm, with you? Sure. Okay. Uh, Ian Lynn is asking, have you ever read Michael Drayton's sonnets, the slightly bizarre, completely obsessive cycle of sonnets? No, I've not. I will look that up. Okay. Right, that's, that's, a, that's another one for your, for your to be read pile. That is nice. <laughs> uh, a question that a couple of people have kind of hinted at uh, and, and kind of asking the same thing. Have you have you thought of adapting notes on the sonnet for a stage performance of any kind, taking this into theatre? No, although there, there was a writer on um, Twitter who contacted me about, like, who was sort of interested in developing. Nothing's really come of it. Although Tom Chivers, who edits Pens on the Margins, like, is quite is he's really quite passionate about developing stage stuff and has worked with with quite a few like Claire Trevian and and, and a few others writers who, who've sort of turned their poetry collection into a kind of like a one-hour show and he's done some really good work on that I feel yeah I don't know I feel like it could almost be like I don't know like something like David Foster Wallace's brief interviews with Hideous Men or something that various productions have kind of done a version of where they just do different they do different bits of it each night so it kind of changes as a work of art every time it's um done. I feel like maybe something like that could work because it's like a 45 minute thing where they just pick a different, whoever the cast is, just picks different ones. I do like the idea of having a sort of, yeah, kind of mixed cast rather than one speaker in a way. I could really see this on the stage when you were reading it, I typed it. <laughs> a few people agreed. I was like, uh, well, it's so Shakespeare to be on the stage as well. And yeah, there's something about you reading it and performing the words. I think it would work really well. You should go for it if you've got opportunities to do it. Yeah. I agree, and I'm a theatre maker, but I also find what I've heard tonight, I haven't got the book yet, but what I've heard tonight is incredibly filmic, very rich and... Very visual. Cook the feast, the wife and the lover kind of vibe. Yeah, that yeah, cool? yeah. Oh, that's a nice reference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Cook the Thief and Abigail's Party. There's an unholy cocktail for you. Okay, thank you everybody. The time, it's, it's almost 20 past eight. I'm, I'm conscious that we're possibly outstaying our work with Luke, who has a family mm. to presumably go home to and feed and put to bed and all that. I, I, I should make sure my children are not just playing Minecraft still. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for uh, for for having me and for thank you all for coming as well for listening. I really absolute pleasure. I think a final round of applause for Luke. I think he's he's more than earned it. Thank you. Okay. It's been an absolute pleasure, Luke. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you to everybody who's come tonight. It's been a wonderful evening. 
Uh, we're almost out of our current season. We have uh, two face-to-face -face writing workshop events coming up at Westbury Art Centre in Milton Keynes on May the 14th. There are details on the website. We have one more event that we're working on, but we haven't actually nailed all the details yet. But if you uh, go to the website and sign up for our newsletter or follow us on Facebook and Twitter, you will be among the first to know. Dave, could I also invite anybody who's um, enjoyed the program that LitFest has delivered? Uh, if anybody wants to join the steering group and help us deliver going forward, then that would be a really good conversation to have. So don't hold back if you're interested in making uh, even better things happen with LitFest in the future. <laughs> and of course, if you haven't yet made your donation for tonight's event, LitFest uh, intends to be uh, funded going forward and every little bit helps. So if you've really liked Luke as much as I've liked Luke, then he must be worth, he must be worth shed loads of money uh, contributing to LitFest. I think it's been a terrific evening. Thank you, Luke. Brilliant. But you'll find links to get in touch with us or to make a donation all on the all on the website. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And good night. Travel safely. Have a wonderful evening.